Hi students, my name's Chris and I teach the only online course in English as a second language or ESL for politics and social science. The course is designed to help advanced ESL learners prepare for a university degree in social sciences like politics, economics, history, that kind of thing. If you want me to be your teacher, you can email me at the address in the description below or just listen to these videos. This is my third video for this channel, continuing with critical thinking about history. We have an expression in English. History is written by the winners. <laughs> what does it mean? Well, what happened in history? How do we know? Who wrote the histories we know and tell each other, and why did they write them? The winners of history, the people in power then and now, are where our most, most of our beliefs and our biggest beliefs about the world come from. A critical thinker might ask, how can we know what really happened? How can we assess the validity of what we hear, what we read in history? And by the way, when, whenever a word comes up here, you might want to uh, practice pronouncing it. When, when you practice pronunciation, it's good not just to say it once, but to say it several times, you know? Say the word maybe five, ten times to yourself. And so you can listen to how I say it. Uh, I'll try to say it very carefully or clearly. And you can repeat it. You can also go back, listen to me say it again very carefully. Listening clearly is a really important part of pronunciation because if you hear something clearly, you can pronounce it correctly. So the validity. How can you assess the validity of what you read and hear about history? Think about the country you live in. Who decides to tell everyone what happened in history? And what do they get out of it? How do they benefit? What do they get out of that reading of history? How do the stories we tell in history books, in school, on TV, and elsewhere, how do they affect the power structure? Are we told to love certain leaders or kings or emperors? Have you ever read more into their lives and accomplishments? How did they become leaders or kings? Also, what stories do we not hear about? Who resisted these kings? Who resisted slavery or other forms of violence? Let's answer those questions with an example. Uh, but, sorry. Before we do, we need to pay the bills. So here's a word from our sponsors. Hey, hey, what's up? This is Chris, a totally different Chris. Uh, did, did that Chris, by the way, mention that there are like a dozen ESL for politics courses that you can choose from? Some of them last between for a few weeks to all the way to six months. That's pretty good for any high-level students interested in taking courses, don't you think? So email us at the address in the description. Uh, I paid for 30 seconds, so... Uh, maybe, maybe... Maybe that's good for now. Thanks. Man, that guy's annoying. <laughs> um, the country whose politics I think, I like to think I know best, is probably the US, or America, as some people incorrectly call it. 
the US being such an important country in the world, I've studied it for years. So who decides what goes into history textbooks in the US? Well, it includes the people in power, in a sense, people who have some kind of economic power, and also those who have already absorbed their messages of patriotism or nationalism or other ideologies. In case you don't know, an ideology is like a set of beliefs, basically a body of belief. The stories Americans tell each other are those of the heroes who fought in the Revolutionary War or the villains who opposed the US and every so often the average people who took a stand. Americans are expected to talk about uh, the people who founded the country as the Founding Fathers. You may or may not have heard this term before, the Founding Fathers. Why? Why fathers? Why do we call them that now? Do they really deserve the same reverence as we're supposed to give to a father? And were there no women involved? These men just did it all on their own? Some of them are considered untouchable. Don't, can't say anything about them. Such as George Washington and Thomas Jefferson who were early presidents. The word freedom is always associated with the US and with these men in particular. But what did they care about freedom? These are men who owned slaves until they died. They created a new state to rule over millions of people. Though we're often told they did that to secure freedom for Americans, there's not a lot of historical evidence that that was their plan. But you need to read beyond the high school textbooks to know that, and most Americans don't. However, you could have guessed they weren't acting selflessly. A few rich men working behind closed doors made decisions that would put them in positions of power over the rest of the population. Does that sound selfless? In the 18th century, they led what is now known as the Revolutionary War, eventually breaking away from the British Empire. So the Revolutionary War, was it a war for freedom? Well, it clearly didn't free the slaves. Indeed, it created a state in which slavery played a major economic and political role. How about natives, the indigenous people, sometimes called Indians? The Revolutionary War created a central state with a military that made war on the natives with much greater force than ever before. So it clearly did not free black people and it did not free native people. Did it liberate women? Women still had no power to vote. They couldn't even speak up in their houses. They were pretty much the property of men for another 150 years or so. Did it free white men, at least? To answer that question, let's consider first President George Washington's time in office. Times were tough. Like today, most wealth and power were in the hands of a small ruling class. In case you've never heard that term before, the ruling class is just the big decision makers, the really rich people who make the decisions. Some poor people lost their land to tax collectors and debt collectors. The state of Massachusetts was confronted with poor people who had had enough. They started trying to stop tax collectors from doing their jobs. Moreover, a number of veterans of the Revolutionary War wanted to receive the payment they'd been promised for their role as soldiers. People were losing their livelihoods and they wanted to fight back. The, the authorities, the ruling class, in the state of Massachusetts, of course, put down the rebellion. They stopped the people. Um, they, they used violence 
to repress, to stop the people from fighting back. They wanted to continue to collect taxes and take people's property without any interference at all. The people fighting for their rights were not free. They were killed and they were imprisoned for doing what was right. This episode of history is known as Shays' Rebellion. A few years later, in 1791, Washington's government imposed a tax on alcohol. And since whiskey was the most popular spirit at the time, it was known as the whiskey tax. Farmers resisted. They saw this tax as a way of taking away their freedom, and of course they were right. Like in Shays' Rebellion, protesters tried to stop tax collectors. The government attacked them. Washington thought it was important to keep the tax, but it was even more important that the power of this new government go unquestioned. That time was perhaps the first time the U.S. government proved that, like all governments, it considered its power to tax and impose laws paramount, meaning more important than anything else, clearly more important than freedom or justice or peace. This incident was known as the Whiskey Rebellion. Most Americans don't know about Shays' Rebellion or the Whiskey Rebellion, or if they did, they would have some excuse for it. Why do you think that is? Most Americans can name the so-called Founding Fathers, but do they know what they did and why? People usually have heroes to look up to, but if you don't choose your own heroes, someone will choose them for you for their own purposes. Here are some people from U.S. history I consider heroes that I think Americans should know more about, not just know their names but look into their stories. Nat Turner, Frederick Douglass, John Brown, Claudette Colvin, Harriet Tubman, Helen Keller, Malcolm X, Huey Newton, Fred Hampton. I think all those people are super important and maybe add to that any labor union who were attacked for going on strike against capitalism and their conditions. I'd like to wrap this video up by reading a passage from a history book like we did in the last couple of videos. This book is called History as Mystery by Michael Parenti. We're just going to read just a short part at the beginning here. Much written history is an ideologically safe commodity. In other words, it fits within mainstream American ideology. It may best be called mainstream history, orthodox history, conventional history, and even ruling class history because it presents the dominant perspective of the affluent and influential people who preside over the major institutions of society. In other words, the perspective you get from, from this ideologically safe history is really just the perspective of the ruling class. It is the kind of history dished up by textbook authors, mainstream academicians, political leaders, government officials, and news and entertainment media. A mass miseducation that begins in childhood and continues throughout life. What we, are usually, what we usually are taught is not reality, but a particular version of it. A version that must pass muster, in other words, be approved by, uh, with the powers that be. Our sense of the past, writes John Geiger, is created for us largely by history's winners. The voices of the losers, when heard at all, are transmitted through a carefully tuned network of filters. In other words, if we ever hear from what we might think of as history's losers, 
we're likely only to see a very limited perspective and get a, uh, an idea of why what they did might have been wrong. For, for decades, John Brown, for one of the people that I just mentioned, was considered crazy. He was always painted as crazy. Really, if you look at what he really did, then you might understand why people wanted to think of him as crazy and wrong-headed. I'll let you look him up on your own. Let's read this again, the full thing, so that you hear the pronunciation and you understand better. Much written history is an ideologically safe commodity. It might best be called mainstream history, orthodox history, conventional history, and even ruling class history, because it presents the dominant perspective of the affluent and influential people who preside over the major institutions of society. It is the kind of history dished up by textbook authors, mainstream academicians, political leaders, government officials, and news and entertainment media. A mass miseducation that begins in childhood and continues throughout life. What we usually are taught is not reality, but a particular version of it. A version that must pass muster with the powers that be. Our sense of the past, writes John Geiger, is created for us largely by history's winners. The voices of the losers, when heard at all, are transmitted through a carefully tuned network of filters. I hope you understood all of that. Of course, if, uh, if you need any help, you can always comment or email me. Oh, I'm happy to help. So what did we learn today? So we learned the, the adage, history is written by the winners. We learned the word validity, how valid something is, how true something is. What do they get out of it? What do you get out of it? In other words, why are you doing it? How do you benefit? The word ideology, very important in the social sciences. Ideology is basically a set of beliefs, not necessarily right or wrong. Um, we've heard of the so-called founding fathers, very important if you're learning American history. We learned the word reverence, admiration or devotion. Why do we show so much reverence to these so-called founding fathers? Uh, this term I'll be referring to a lot in this series, the ruling class. That's just the most powerful people in society, basically. A veteran or a vet is a, someone who is a former soldier, usually someone who's been in a war, not just a soldier, but someone from a war. A veteran of a war. To put down something, in this case, to put down a rebellion, to put down an uprising means to stop people from fighting back. The word paramount means the most important thing. It's paramount. It's the most important thing we can do. Um, and to review some of my heroes. <laughs> Thanks everyone for watching. That's it for today. See you next Sunday.